tous. Bonjour à tous. Je vous prie, s'il vous plaît. Please do take seats and uh, uh, for those who are in the uh, Le, monsieur devant, pouvez-vous lui demander de se, oui, qu'il se déplace, lui, ouais. lui, faut qu'il se déplace, le, le grand là, là. Non, il n'a pas compris, il n'a pas compris. Tu veux vraiment faire ça Attends. Valérie Millon, member of the circle of the economists, who, who unfortunately will be on video because unfortunately she's COVID. She's had uh, everything we had this COVID. And uh, we now with us in Aix-en-Provence, we have with us Laurence de Villiers, who is a teacher at the, in Saclay, and um, Sophie Narbonne, Narbonne, who is a director in charge of uh, economic regulation in the CNIL the National Commission on uh, Computer uh, and uh, Freedom, uh, Ramon Fernandez, who is financial director for Orange, Mathieu Courtecuis, uh, president and founder of a consulting group, SIA Partners, who have just uh, bought a, a, a group in Australia, I think uh, he's got a great ambition, and then Mrs. the Minister of Secretary uh, of State uh, to the in charge of childhood. Ch uh, so I will, I will give the floor to Valérie Na Mion so that she will introduce this session on regulating the GAFAM. Thank you, Eric. Uh, welcome to this session on regulating GAFAMs. I would like to apologize. I cannot be with you, but as Eric said, I've been COVID hit. So the restructure, the, the weight of the GAFAM in the economy is uh, growing, and this is even more visible, was well, even more visible in, during the pandemics. In addition to the growth, you know, uh, uh, claims against GAFAM uh, become more intense. Facebook, for example, uh, has been uh, charged with eliminating competition in social networks by buying at a huge price Instagram in 2012 and Instagram in 2012. Uh, you know that Google uh, bought YouTube in 26, 2006 and it is now being attacked for its practice of uh, monopolistic uh, practice for search engine. So the main uh, domain or the main, the main blame against GAFAM is that they hinder competition. So again, these anti-competition practices of the digital uh, giants, what can we do in terms of regulation? First option would be to tax the GAFAM. This means that we would need to have a rapid evolution of the legal framework designed for traditional economy in the sense that only companies present in one country could be uh, taxed by that country. But the GAFAM escaped the rule because they offer their global services being installed in a country of their choice, which has the uh, most advantageous tax system for them. So therefore, GAFAM do not pay or pay very little tax. And discussions are now in progress at the G20 to impose a digital tax, but so far, it, till now, it's been rejected by the US. An additional lead could be to ask the GAFAM to uh, do to provide financial contribution as a support to digital infrastructures because of the importance of the traffic that is generated. A second lead, which could be practiced, would be uh, dismantling GAFAM to uh, interrupt their growth. So the expected benefits of such an operation would be uh, quite doubt, uh, doubtful. Why? Because. So it would be easier to regulate a large number of actors of GAFAM instead of a large conglomerate. No, no, the monopoly power doesn't guarantee the monopoly would be uh, removed and could actually extend to several sectors. And the dismantling of GAFAM would cause probably a weakening of the GAFAM versus, you know, against the uh, Chinese GAFAM who can become almighty powerful much more powerful than the U.S. counterparts. 
So the dismantling is not uh, in the agenda right now. So third lead would be that uh, penalties and financial sanctions, even though they can be significant, they, they will intervene ex post and their amount rem remain limited versus the benefits, benefit, the profits made by the digital companies. A fourth initiative would would lead to major interest. We need a, we have a legislation project uh, provided by the European Union via two texts, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act, DMA, and the adoption should be done in 2022. So the DSA should regulate the illicit content of advertising, the hate talks and fake news which are broadcast on digital platforms. The DMA would concern the regulation of competition on digital market with the will to basically minimize the, uh, the, the monopoly or domineering uh, position that will affect competition. Third aspect, what we call the Governance Data Act, is also planned concerning the sharing of data between the various players in society. This European project, legislative European project, European legislative project, sorry, would uh, provide an ex ante regulation framework and not a uh, form of ex post measures to correct, well, the gaps or within the competitive practices. So regulation becomes, therefore, preventive regulation. Another uh, excente regulation lead would be to control the way data is collected and provided to the third, par to third parties. Data available to the GAFAM uh, is becoming a full-fledged strategic tool, and this is needed on the market. They are needed on the market. But anyway, well, simply to minimize the competition of third parties, of the, the giants, you know, the GAFAM, you know, to, we could make the access to data m more difficult and exclude them de facto to, from the market. So the question is that of regulation of data, and it should logically uh, it will be uh, done by the competition authorities. Eventually, what we can see is that regulating the GAFAM is a very complex task, and we will need to find the correct balance between regulation and, and non-block hindering regulation and competition. So we'll discuss this today with our speakers that we're very happy to and very honored to welcome. Eric, I give you the floor again. So this is the Gerald table uh, or picture, if I could say so. Now, uh, uh, rapidly, let me tell you my feelings. In fact, regulating GAFAM is what we are doing, actually. It is difficult, we, it is uh, tedious, but don't think that we do nothing, we, we, as we hear sometimes too often. And especially in Europe, which is, you know, actually leading the process, as Valérie reminded us. So what do we do within this uh, legal, uh, European legal framework? So, uh, Laurence, thank you, Laurent de Villa, professor at Sorbonne and uh, researcher at the uh, CNRS in artificial intelligence. I work with economists. I don't work with economists on that topic, but on the behavior of customers, of people, individuals who use AI through their mobile phones, social networks, and so on and so forth. And I work on standards. Why? Laurence. Laurence uh, just published a book, a lovely title. I rushed to buy it called Emotional robots, emotional between, bra uh, between brackets, so emotional robots. And uh, anyway, this is an attractive title. Uh, can robots have emotions? So I come with research on the what they call affective computing. So I'm uh, I'm doing machine learning. So you know, I try to. Uh, the legislation we are setting up in Europe, the IDI, the MADSA, this is essential to preserve our market. 
uh, we have a certain uh, power. We, we are a very attractive market. And as uh, Madame Lagarde said quite rightly yesterday, we do have allies coming on this market. So it's a major market. And we, we are a major market. And we can see this through several aspects. First, GAFAM are here. BAT acts. Huawei is more and more. Aliba is here. Um, Alibaba, who is taking over the uh, will we deal with the, the Olympic Games 2024. Huawei, for example, it presents for standards. So. Uh, started with the idea that we need to reinforce our economy. We have to believe in this. We have to risk. If we are not able in Europe to to try innovation to preserve our values, we'll hit the wall. So, in the solutions, we will re rely on law, on legislation in progress, as well as on the, on the ethical rules of ethics. You know how do. Do, do not give your data, don't be manipulated by the systems. We need to educate. And the third point are standards. And standards, we do them for industrialists, European industrialists, so that they can innovate with values, you know, paying attention to this, the energy expenditures and by creating a market for us. It is essential to understand that standards, and I'm in charge right now of a standard called AR and Enhanced Nudge. What is it? Well, it is basically incitation to do nudges, you know, but in digital, uh, you know, it's exponential. So, you know, you got that, you take a hotel room, and the little la line said 25 other people are looking for the same room. So I click on this, all this is well. So you have to be aware of the, the NC, those system, the omni ubiquitous system which capture our emotions and data. But what is it, meta, you know, emotional prison? You know, I will not be able to distance myself real from me in the metaverse. And behind that, there will be new jobs, new psychiatry to be considered, and a lot of vulnerability. And the last point I would like to describe here, indeed, we have to understand that we are vulnerable. Uh, we, we're vulnerable we do, uh, versus the systems, you know, rules, law of ethics, and the economic market should be here. The European market uh, is draining new forces so that we could develop innovation, which would be respectful, positive, responsible and responsible of the energy consumption, of the presence of men and women on an equal footing, you know, gender equality. And 80 percent of systems that talk to us, uh, social robots and so on, they call Alexa, Samantha, voice, women voice, bo women bodies. Are they just uh, servants, uh, you know, robots that can be turned off at will? So consider what is being represented in digital society. Just imagine tomorrow, underground, Huawei is behind, uh, and both many players uh, try to establish that we have to be aware of the fact this is a war, and we need all the forces and all the forces in, in multidisciplinarity. Don't think we are heads and we don't think about the consequences. It is the alliance between economists with IT experts, philosophers, and in society, a uh, plurality of digital humanity that we will be able to take power. And remember, we are very good. We don't say it enough. We were very good in maths. We were first in Shanghai, uh, Rating and Saclay, third in La Sorbonne. So what are we going to become if we don't believe in it anymore? Last year, a little flag, a president of the Blaise Pascal Foundation, organized by Cédric Villani, with Serge Abibul and other major player in the digital world, and what does it work? What does it discuss? You know, the mediation in mathematics for school will be on Nintendo Telematin, 12th of July. So please, you know, we have to push for the idea that we need to educate as we do the regulations. And it is essential that economy should be at the heart of everything we're going to do tomorrow to remain positive innovation again, responsible for all. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> so so. Uh, okay, so I will now we will now give the floor to Sophie. Sophie, Sophie Nerbon will call the uh, GDPR. You know another European initiative, another Euro European initiative which functions how well, badly, well, well. Thank you, thank you. But I'll do transition now with uh, responsible innovation or, or the objective of uh, the, the objective of general regulation, general data uh, 
regulation is one of the solutions when it comes to regulation of GAFAM, just as the rest of the digital economy, because the text, uh, the the uh, GDPR applies to all professional domains, you know, private and uh, public, and concerns only personal data. And we've seen that they are the heart of all the deployment strategies for new technologies, new services, and tomorrow's product. So the, the stack is huge. And indeed, uh, possibly for four observations to uh, beforehand for the, uh, the application of the GDPR, first, it's not the single solution, it should be uh, more and more. It should be uh, balanced and uh, through the interregulation, regulators will, we should not work in silo. I'll come back to this and uh, it is especially with the uh, uh, competition authority. Uh, it is a work we done in depth, with work we do in depth, but not just for the uh, cases we may have to uh, manage on a, on a case by case, you know, very much like it takes place in the UK or in the Netherlands. Second, the GDPR, GDPR, everybody says, you know, not just the clear, so I can say it, you know, I can uh, link up the fact that uh, it is a success, legally speaking, because it is now a global standard adopted, uh, used all over the world. Uh, we talked about it in the state of California, Brazil, as well in Africa. Well, they inspire themselves from it, but they don't actually. Well, so it's a European success. So I think we can be proud uh, of that. And uh, and the European Commission wants to do to redo that again for the uh, Artificial Intelligence Act you've talked about. Now, uh, there is law and reality. When it comes to reality, four years of application, we can say indeed that a lot's been done, but it's not sufficient. And we cannot really talk yet about us operational success, as we could talk about the le legal success. I'll come back to that. And fourth remark, I'll conclude by saying that, well, I I'd like to pinpoint uh, the role of businesses to so that they should use more uh, significantly, well, it's a constraint, but as a performance accelerator, because it is a vector of trust, you know, uh, for clients, for suppliers, you know, the entire supply chain partnership of digital ecosystem. Yeah, now we can see it. All partners ask if there is a uh, GDPR conformity, hence the deployment of uh, certification system and good, uh, good professional practice codes. So clearly, as businesses, you have a responsibility to use it simply, uh, you know, as a competitiveness asset, because this will uh, is part of a competition parameter just as the price. So I think for a circle of economists, it was worth mentioning. Now, no, I have two minutes left. So I will insist on the question of uh, extraterritoriality, which for a long time was uh, the major issue to be able to regulate GAFAMs. And in that respect, the, the GDPR was a, a breakthrough because once you target European uh, uh, citizens, wherever the, co the company is, unlike what was presented initially when it comes to fiscal law, uh, rules apply. So therefore, uh, European companies know that uh, there is no uh, distorted competition because foreign companies have to comply and uh, follow the rules. And there is a, a, sort, a, a sort of a monitor of the law, the European Court of Justice, which clearly m takes very emblematic decisions, which create uh, legal stability for a companies and administration when it says, oh, sorry, uh, the agreement signed between the US and Europe to guarantee the protection of personal data going to the US. Well, does not uh, comply with the European standards, so I uh, will invalidate this agreement. So, clearly, uh, there are huge difficulties to find right now, now it's a question of time, you know, to find solutions, but which led us in the instruction of uh, uh, claims we get more and more, they doubled, the claims doubled between 2016 and 2019. And it's just the beginning. So, 
So on this question of extraterritoriality, a stronger position taking to maintain pressure, to keep pressure. And we can see law is a weapon. Law is a weapon. We know we must know how to use it, as the US and Chinese do, by the way. And uh, you know, in terms and on the mode of regulation, maybe give you com some illustration about what our of what I was saying, we, our regulation is done ex ante via the production of guidelines, uh, the good practice guides, and so on and so forth. We announced what we we know what we were going to do. We did it for cookies, you know. We we I heard in the previous conference on digital sovereignty, DGPR, did GDPR I was a disaster for press editors. It's not the GDPR; it was the business model of cookies, which is based on the uh, predating. Uh, predating uh, captation of that internal uh, web users data the CNIL made the rec issued recommendation it uh, it left enough time for conformity compliance and then you know we move on to repression punishment exposed with sanction you know uh, uh, unknown sanctions for okay it's not much but for example this year for example where in 2021 it was 247 million euros mainly in uh, we're dealing with cookies when it comes to Google and uh, and Amazon and now we um, I will conclude by saying that indeed when it comes to digital education all actions that we carry out through a collective that federates more than 70 entities from the from the academic world, uh, co corporate foundations, and so on and so forth, we must continue and uh, and add up to what is being done and what should be done. Thank you. <laughs> Europe defends the values, you know, but I think all this is based on this. Uh, you know, the defense of values is based on an economic and technological for solidity, robustness, which is somewhat damaged vis-a-vis -vis the overpower, uh, economic and technological overpower of the Chinese and the Americans. Now, from that viewpoint, can we have a picture of the European force? Are they regaining ground when it comes to the economy and the technology? Ramon Fernandez. Thank you, Eric. Good morning to all of you. Three quick points. First, why is it a topic? Second, what did we do? And the third one, what should we do? So why do we be worried about GAFAM regulation? Well, Rubert Vébrin, who will take the floor tomorrow, published uh, geopolitical you know, the uh, poli uh, geopolitics uh, dictionary, but so there are very, very, uh, well, quite a high, high number of references referring to GAFAM, Sover uh, sovereignty, overpower, influence, Alexander the Great, and so on and so forth. So quite a lot of them, and we can see GAFAM have become uh, full-fledged players of geopolitics and of today's world. So we got to be, well, to be concerned about it, but still pay attention to it because those are the new masters of the world, the new shapers of the world. We cannot ignore it. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, it's just an obsession with regulation in France. It is a societal stake, bearing in mind that uh, Europe is fragmented. It was said early on. So Europe is a playing field which is rather open, and it is a playing field for such players. Second thing we have to be aware of, and why we should, you know, take care of it. So, take 20 platform, the 20 largest platform in the world, none is European, and you can see that those players have gained highly dominating position. Google is 91 percent of global search and queries. Difficult to get a pie of the market, a part of the uh, share of the pie. If you take musical, Netflix is 45 percent of the video in the world, uh, um, videos in the world, sorry. So the players uh, diversify on the foreign Google started on search and today is 10% of the global cloud. That's the first thing of players who are key and with uh, multiple impacts and we, we can't dwell on that. But then what did we do? Eric was right to say so. In fact, a lot of things are being done. We talked about the G GDPR, which fuels different comments, but it is a progress nevertheless. 
DMA, DSA, Digital, Digital Market Act, Digital Service Act, that uh, we have to, uh, uh, what the, the text have been, uh, uh, that has been a, a prowess, you know, that was a record time, you know, Thierry Breton, Boston, you know, uh, with the president of the European Commission, you know, uh, being uh, happy about it with all those who contributed to it. So in terms of regulation, what they call the gatekeepers, platforms, and when it comes to competitions contro competition control, there are major breakthroughs to avoid what we call the killer acquisition because those uh, giants, when someone uh, comes, crops up, you know, they buy it over, you know, and they do great things, but uh, therefore the competition, ca competition cannot grow. And then there are l less obvious progress on international tax system because the rule of unanimity in terms of fiscal system is hell to make, uh, you know, a noticeable product is complicated. Anyway, progress are being achieved and uh, they've been concentrated on a better regulation for consumers, which is, of course, essential. We should be happy with that. We'll have to go into the application of the text. Once we, I mean, those are DMA, DMA, DSA. Uh, these uh, regulations are direct application. You don't have transposition into local or domestic laws. This is all very well. I mean, you know, we all complain all the time, but trust me, it's good. Let's face it. So when it comes to a telco op, Telecom operators, okay, um, I'm orange, you know, telco up, you know, so uh, Christian Edman was saying it this morning, we do invest like mad, you know, we're happy to do so, but as a manager uh, of the one GAFAM was happy to say, your investment are our profit, so so the, the topic of uh, telco, and they were, he was saying it, you know, it wasn't a sort of a confidential offer. No, 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 it was just uh, do invest uh, new telco ops and first in infrastructures and we'll make profits. And indeed, we know the capitalizations. Uh, so the, the amount of uh, stock uh, capitalization, the three first European operators, was lower at the beginning of the year to the smallest of the GAFAM. So, you know, it is an amazing unbalance of power. So what can we do more to avoid such telco ops who make it possible for the digital world to exist without our networks? They don't exist. So we're not the only ones, of course. Uh, you know, GAFAM have invented uh, in amazing services. They were able uh, to you know, but without the networks, they don't run, they don't function. And the more they grow, the more we need to invest in our networks because we have to uh, absorb the capa the, this capacity. Two priorities for us. First, competition policy. There is progress in the DMA, but it has to work. We have to make sure that the fat one will lose weight, they're obese. So we have to make sure that they, but we want to allow the smallest to get a bit of, get a bit of, of gain a bit of weight. So the, we have to look at the world geopolitics, China, the US, and the telco ops should be able to reinforce themselves in the US. They went from four to three operators in Belgium. They're introducing a fourth operator four in Luxembourg. I don't mind. I like uh, Belgium and Luxembourg, but it doesn't make sense. So telco ops should be stronger, more consolidated to play on the global market. Otherwise, we'll be dwarves and we will cry about digital uh, sovereignty for a long time. But operators will have left everything. And if we be private equity funds, they will take over. Second thing is a discussion we call the fair share. And Eric, you mentioned it early on. What is very strange about this world is that these, the, GAF, the ten GAF, the GAFAMs do not participate in the funding of the infrastructures that we deploy, whereas we actually think that among the next four years we'll have to invest ten extra billions in France, no, in Europe. It's, it's, it's huge. And 55% of the traffic is done by six platforms. So what do we mean by the share? And this is actually a debate that we have within the European Commission that we opened this uh, spring. We say, OK, GAFAM should participate in the funding of the infrastructures. And that will be a huge struggle. But it's actually quite existential. Concretely, how? Well, when you're in a car and you take a, a, a highway, then you pay for the toll, right? It seems normal. GAFAMs, our friends that we love, they do not pay anything as a toll. 
when actually traffics explode and that require uh, that requires actually a lot of investment we actually have this in asia there was a requirement from a platform i won't quote it that's a court of justice that decided it to increase to actually invest in the infrastructures to face the explosion of traffic related to it was actually a, a TV show that actually uh, re required a lot of appetite, and uh, that was in South Korea. Thank you. How uh, I like your idea about um, making the fat ones uh, 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 lose weight. There's no GAFAMs around the, f the, the table, as you can see. We don't give them the floor because it's not very convenient. They are under the table, if we may say. Can we say that? In the room as well. Some of them are in the room. I haven't asked. I'm not asking you to defend them, but maybe we should ask questions. As, uh, actually, I would like you to speak as if you were defending them. So uh, in terms of regulation, we can talk about innovation as well and say that now, we uh, really need a lot of innovation. We have to localize it, of course, but uh, face when we have this inflation, we should have more IA, we should have more productivity, and we need these ecosystems that would be placed at our disposal to develop growth for the 10 years to come to fight against uh, uh, carbonation as well. We need tech companies to, to fight for decarbonation. It's very important, and regulation should position itself as well under the aegis of innovation, not before, but after. And I think this is a very important because we're not going to regulate things that have not existed until now. So now, the impression that is ours is that these platforms or these uh, high, giant tech uh, uh, industries do not care about regulation. It's wrong. They are afraid about. They are afraid of sanctions because they, their reputation is at stake. Their capital is at stake. A platform nowadays has 500, 600, 700 regulators throughout the world. It's much more than a bank. They have more uh, manpower dedicated to managing regulations with uh, Meta than in a bank. So they have understood how important these regulations are and the weight that they have. But beyond regulations and the objectives that they pursue, if we take the example of uh, GDPR, as was said earlier during the previous roundtable on the same issue, when we look at uh, competitive uh, um, uh, themes like uh, online ad, even if it w it it wasn't the first purpose of GDPR. It actually speeded, speeded up the concentration. And for these stakeholders, for them, I think that rather have regulations rather than having uh, litigation, because it has a cost. And they are overwhelmed nowadays with uh, litigation and being sued. And this is why, with uh, regulations, it channels litigation uh, potential. And it, we, we need to have regulatory frameworks. And we can take a profit in terms of competitive uh, dynamic, because this is what we want. We want to have competition. And with the arrival of TikTok, for instance, it created more concerns than the arrival of GDPR. So these competitive dynamisms, when we say, OK, we have dominant positions that are such that we cannot have anything, anyone arriving. Well, it's not true, because we have someone which arrived uh, very soon. And it will be forbidden in the US very, very soon, I, I think. It shows that it is possible to challenge them. So, you know, uh, we can still do something. I mean. Uh, but it was in a Chinese way. Well, yes, but it was also a market share acquisition in the US that was actually important. And we're not really up to par with the TikTok uh, market share right now. So we can still challenge them. So why can't we in Europe have such giants? Because we only think about regulations. But never, it's, it's starting to, but we never think about public procurement. Maybe we could have we, we're more thinking about uh, regulations than having public procurement to fund uh, breakthrough uh, innovation. 
we want to have our values transcribed and our uh, rules, but we could have them in a book of specifications. We'd rather have texts of law and to pile them up rather than steering actually uh, calls for bids. Um, but there is a, a European engagement, actually. It's changing. Yeah, we're changing. But it's been going on for dozens of years. We actually have a train to catch, really. And in terms of uh, uh, we have to invest more in breakthrough innovation and rather on new legislation. And these stakeholders have started to learn as well and thinking about regulation when we see it with the metaverse and the addictive behaviors that could actually result from that. We've been working on that. And we can see that they are anticipating a certain number of functionalities that should be part and parcel of these platforms that could have some uh, uh, problems in the and we are, they're not waiting for these regulations. This is why it's so hard to regulate metaverse, because the regulators do not know what there will be in the metaverse. And so it's up to the stakeholders to understand and to anticipate that and to self-regulate themselves. We have to recognize also that the place of these stakeholders is very important. And they're, always, they're also partners of the state in the fight against terrorism, for instance. Por, uh, fight against pornography, human trafficking, uh, the fight against uh, money laundering. It's of vital importance now. And so we have to weave and forge these partnerships. We shouldn't always be pitted against one another. And we have to work with them. What is important, therefore, is to find arrangements and to make sure that these uh, partners actually work more on R&D, that they have operations that would be more deployed in Europe, that they work on the deployment on these ecosystems. This is exactly what's happening. We have a cloud of, tr of trust because we understood that we couldn't build everything from scratch and regulations could not prevent it. Thank you. You've just mentioned pornography. Mrs. The, so, dear minister, you're in charge of childhood. What could we do to protect child, the children? Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm talking about the public sector, and especially a public that is very uh, specific, that is actually the age group of ch children. It's a target group, but it's also a vulnerable group. You've talked about sovereignty, economics. You've talked about competition. I'm going to talk about protection. And you can understand that, of course, I'm in favor of regulation, but not only, it's not enough. And I think that we should combine, we could actually engage the stakeholders in our actions. A few figures that could actually be very self eloquent. Uh, for, we have nine years old for the 18 percent of uh, children from six to seven years are actually registered with social networks, TikToks and uh, Snapchat. The proportion increases to 40 percent for the age group of eight to 11 years old. Of course, this could be a leverage of uh, empowerment education. That doesn't mean that it is a disaster. As is said in China, they want actually to uh, cut off all access to uh, social networks. But there are consequences that could be harmful. At 12 years old, one third of children have had access to porn content. 20% have been victims of cyber harassment. And these figures actually increase to 25% for high school uh, uh, pupils. So that's very important. Without having figures, it is also demonstrated that the use the important use of, uh, t of iPads for children has actually physical consequences, but also mental consequences. And the use of uh, tablets, of iPads and uh, phones by the, ch the parents also has consequences on the language evolution of the children because they are, there's less interaction between the parents and the children. This is what's happening to us. I'm not going to hide the fact that the health crisis had actually multiplied by uh, by 10 by uh, the uh, problems that actually are affecting children. Families are actually overwhelmed right now in front of this use. They don't know how to handle that, how, how to act upon it. 
Should they actually give orders? Should they educate? That means that we have a long way to come. I'm in favor of regulations, as I said. It is true that the arrival and the adoption of DSA uh, is uh, good news. The enactment of uh, the DSA is good news. We know that it has been actually adopted by the parliament. We'll have fast content for uh, to fight against terrorism, child pornography, anything that is online. The President of the Republic has charged us with uh, my colleague, Mr. Barrault, to work uh, as a supplement to see to this act to work on content offered to children. We're not uh, uh, working on the providers of content, but rather on protection from the public uh, service. And this will be in my roadmap. We also have national legislation. Uh, operators will have to implement the systematic introdu in the introduction of parental control for access for any content that is accessed, uh, that is um, uh, being given access to children. But we have to inform and educate parents. And uh, not a lot of parents actually can manage uh, the uh, parental control access. That's part of and parcel of the things on which we have to work on. Legislation, of course, that implies that we need to educate and inform. This is why I gave you some figures. But we also need to train in, at school. They have started already with some uh, PICS uh, training. They started to inform on data. When I, I said, uh, when I was talking about children, we need to uh, give knowledge on the rights and the risk, Algorithi algorithms that can actually send them into a tunnel of information that is very specific. They need to have this information. And we need also to have element of information on this risk that is theirs, their own risks. A lot of operators are working on that. I'm sorry to um, uh, promote e enfance which is a very dynamic association contributing to training at school, training and educating parents. But also there's the 3018. That's a telephone number. You should actually insert it where everybody can call to whistleblow uh, um, cyber harassment events, but also to talk about any kind of events that they have to experience on online. That can actually help with GAFAM to have access on this information. And GAFAMs can rely upon children and the young people because they are the ones that are the most relevant to talk with uh, these people. And there's a lot of good practices that have been set up that have been uh, disseminated by the children to the children. Sometimes we have to go further. We have police officers, that law enforcement agencies that are aiming at working on this and uh, on GAFAMs when, whenever there's actually criminal actions undertaken that we cannot accept, of course. I've said a lot of things and we're very committed this morning, if I manage to actually trigger some uh, red alert, this is a good thing. It's a very wonderful and deep partnership that we have. CNIL, the Data Privacy uh, Protection Agency, is working on this as well. We have to work within our private life, but also within our economic spaces, via the parents, via the corporations, to convey this message GAFAMs are indeed a space that is extraordinary, but beware because they are vulnerable age groups, they are vulnerable population groups such as our children. Thank you. Merci, uh, bon Thank you. There's a lot of topics and we should actually dwell on that subject. Do we do enough? as uh, Europe has to change the size in, uh, in terms of sovereignty. When we say that half of the parents are completely overwhelmed, they don't know what to do, isn't it up to the public authorities to take control, to take over? We've talked about China that decided to prohibit uh, online games, the video games for children uh, uh, when it exceeds three hours a week. That's actually completely against uh, uh, freedom. We want to educate our children the way we want, but that's a matter of freedom. Do we do enough? But that's what I'm wondering. We certainly don't do enough, bearing in mind all the stakes, all the risks, 
that uh, can actually have an impact on the mental and physical health of our children. Education is, and training and information are always to be favored. Uh, rather than prohibiting uh, things, we have standards that that have been taken over by the French legislation and also substantiated by the French legislation. We have to work with all stakeholders, GAFAMs included. And as you said, there's the, a huge economic uh, wealth of resources, and our children are actually a target that is very interesting for advertisement. We should use them, and I'm sure that themselves, they have an interest in participating into the training and the protection of our children, because our children will be their end users in, in the future. And so it needs to be done with common values. Laurence, yes, I love this energy, but for five years, I have to say that I haven't seen a lot of trainings. We actually uh, are promoting coding uh, at school, but we should also talk about safety. What do we do when we're manipulated? What about game addiction? And I haven't seen any training on this. And all these uh, associations that we support are good. I think we should work hand in hand. It's a national association, so I think there's a lot of places where we don't have a university where we can have an ecosystem that would collect all these uh, venues to understand what's happening. And also there's a huge concern on education because we do not have IT teachers overnight. We won't have them overnight. So in the reality where we are with seniors, with the elderly, we have to ask people to come back. How can we do that smoothly? to engage a study on IT, AI, ethics, uh, data safety, to raise awareness as well on the energy that is spent. I think our children could understand it and their parents as well. When we talk about associations in Vitry-sur-Seine and in Clermont-Ferrand and elsewhere, we should push for it. And I haven't seen this effort really made by the government over the last five years. So I think that thanks to you, you're actually opening up a huge boulevard for me when saying that, because this is part and parcel of my road path. The president has said it again. It is a priority. I have a lot of leeway on the digital world is a priority. Yesterday I was in Pray in, in Praha because they're actually taking over the, the uh, EU presidency. So we need to have a fourth pillar on the ch on childhood issues. We'll definitely have a spin-off act from the DSA to talk about children. I'm optimistic, but I'm also stubborn. And on this subject, I think we will work a lot on this. It, they have an essential role to play the public authorities, but we have to rely upon the monitoring and control authorities. But I think you're quite severe because monitoring authorities have done a lot already. But let's regulate the gap farms, but bring them along. Let's let's them let's uh, make them tag along in our projects because childhood is a subject that is quite consensual. Protection of children is something that we all agree with, and GAFAM certainly would join us. They have already uh, invested funds to protect our children from the negative effects of uh, uh, the uh, products of GAFAM. I can stream. It's the first time that I'm speaking it's up like this, but I really counted on this being said. So another subject, we should regulate GAFAMs. But for this, we have to go to see where they are, and they are in the US. Who can actually uh, give us a, a, a little overview? The president right now is trying to do something, but they do not have a lot of uh, political uh, power within the parliament. So should we reach out? What should we do with them? Hamon, do you want to talk about this? What we could say about this is that there's also very uh, tense debate on this subject in the U.S. as well. In California, there's a uh, GDPR uh, in California. It's not really the same, but it's, it's, it's something which is important. There's a huge debate on that subject. 
It's a huge su subject of debate on extraterritoriality of laws. It's an old subject, but we definitely have to continue and make progress on this because this refers back to the capacity of Europe to determine its own standards, to impose them, to exist on the international forum on European digital identity. We have that in Europe, we have dictated our own standards, maybe from the social point of view, environmental point of view. It's part and parcel of our DNA. And I think we should continue talking about this. We need to have tools. We need to have operators. We still have the capacity to have uh, digital operators, stakeholders that could remain active in telecom especially. I'm sorry if I talk about this, but I'm utterly convinced about it. If we do not create a regulatory framework where everybody can find its place, the GAFAMs will carry everything away uh, with them. In the US, when we talked about sanctions, sanctions are much bigger in the US than in Europe, you have to say. It's actually billions of uh, dollars. So authorities may be the, uh, the AG Commission, which is actually the equivalent of the uh, CCRF. They actually uh, impose huge sanctions. But there's no equivalent of the GDPR in the US. There are sectorial laws. It's important to say that for the protection of minors, the Americans had adopted a law that is very tough with uh, difficult implementation because for the minors, how we, it's difficult to actually determine the age of a minor, but that's actually a legal issue that we have to solve and we're trying to have experts giving opinions on that. There's no l federal law yet, but there are state laws right now. And you were referring to California. In one word, I think it's quite interesting to explain why California enacted this law because it's uh, a millionaire who actually made its wealth out of uh, real estate actually realized that all his four children were actually on um, uh, spending all their time on uh, iPads and, and he said that's not part and parcel of our values and this is why he invested a lot of money in uh, lobby offices and in um, uh, lawyer firms and they saw that there was this uh, GDPR in, in the US and they in, in, in Europe, and they tried to copy in the US. I'm sorry, we have to stop because we actually have to go to the next session. I thank you for your attendance, and we'll now uh, skip the next session. Thank you.